Hello, hello, hello. Happy New Year, Happy New Year, Happy New Year. And all the best for the New Year. I hope everybody is keeping well. And yeah, we are back. Yo, guys, um, a lot has been happening, right? A lot has been happening. Life happens to the best of us. <laughs> hi everybody thanks for joining thanks for for coming through um how's the new year treating you i hope you are keeping well um i hope you are doing well Let me know if you can hear me properly and whether the sound is good and all those things. Hey, Fiona. Hey, how are you? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. All the best for the New Year. <laughs> Thank you so much. How's everything going? It's good. Um, I'm tired today. I started off my day at 7 o'clock. Oh, goodness. Like, with a, with, a, with a workshop at 7 o'clock. So I'm now what? feeling it. Oh, shame. I'm and, so and I'm going to be doing it every week for the next 12 weeks. I'm like, what did I do to myself? Starting at 7. <laughs> That's very early. 7 to half past 8. Um, but it's, 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 it's one of those graduate programs that I really enjoy doing. Um, and, 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 and the boss of this company that I'm doing it for, he said to me, just find, find an awkward time so that they know that they need to show up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that definitely is an awkward time indeed. I'm guessing it's obviously online. It is online. It is online. Oh, okay, is great. great. Yeah, no, no, it's online. There was no way I would be showing up at some office at 7 <laughs> o'clock in the morning. No, yeah, no, that would have been hectic. Yeah, no. Otherwise, how are you, are you keeping well? Yes, yes, I'm good, good. I guess ready for the new year, getting into the group of things. I, I miss waking up and doing nothing, but I suppose uh, I'm, I'm getting, I'm weaning myself back into, you know, being productive. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good, that's good. Good to see you, good to really see you. So, Fiona, I think let's just jump into it. Um, so the biggest thing, because I work a lot with um, clients that want to change careers, and, and sometimes people are, are saying they are not sure um, of what is the next career. But some of them are very sure. Some of them are like, I want to be a this. And then when I ask them, like, have, do you know what it entails? Do you know how you actually qualify? Do you know how you get to be this thing? Mm. And, and do you know what is the day-to-day -day of what this job looks like? Mm. And then I get a blank stare. Like, no. <laughs> like, <okay. laughs> you know, sometimes... Yeah. You, you want to get some more information about this thing that you think you, you like yes. up until maybe you talk to somebody who's doing it and then you realize that actually, no, it's not the thing, you know? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely, yeah. And I think you, it, I, I totally resonate with you in terms of having that experience as well with people that are, are passionate about a particular field yet you realize that sometimes they just only have a very superficial understanding of, of what it is. Yeah. Okay. So as I said to you, so that's why you're here today. Um, you are one of the few people that I'll be speaking to on the different careers because I, I just thought this year, let me just focus on it and, and we'll save the Insta Live even students that might be thinking about it or anybody else that might be thinking about it will always find it um so i think that's that's the point that i want to make so i think the biggest thing um fiona is that you you are an industrial psychologist break it down for us what what does that mean just from a high level then we'll, we'll get deeper into how do you qualify and all these other things 
Thanks. Yeah. So organizational psychology or industrial psychology in some parts of the world is called occupational psychology. You, you know, it's also colloquially known as work psychology is basically one of the six. I think we are one of the six ca psychology categories that we have in South Africa. So in South Africa, you can practice in one of six categories of, South, um, of psychology, right? So organizational psychology is one of them. And in a very basic elevator pitch manner, what that means is you apply and use principles of psychology to solve workplace problems. That really is the simplest way with which, within which uh, I can define it, right? So in that regard, um, you know, what differentiates us, I suppose maybe from other professionals that you might find in corporate, is the, the training and the accreditation that is required for you to then practice. So it is a register. So as an organizational psychologist, you are a registered health professional with the Health Professions Council of South Africa, which means you must adhere to the Health Professions Act. And of course, the, the laws that govern the practice of psychology. But really, in summary, you're using psychology in an organization or industrial context, uh, so to speak, as opposed to a clinical environment a hospital and, you know, dealing with other matters that we typically can see outside of the workplace. Okay. So what, what makes it different by being in the workplace? So what psychological things are you dealing with in the workplace? What does that mean? <laughs> a good question. Yeah. So how we differ, because people don't normally know what's the difference between, let's say, an organizational psychology and maybe a clinical psychologist or a counseling yeah. psychologist, which is sort of like our other. I won't go into the other categories, but I think I'll just con contrast those two because those are the ones that, that people commonly know. But ultimately, the difference with us is, so you find clinical and counseling psychologists deal with, you know, I don't know if that's what it's still referred to as, you know, abnormal psychology. So this is people who have depression, anxiety, and basically you're trying to get someone to perform at a functioning level, right? So it means that for whatever reason, they might be performing below functioning, right? So as I mentioned, this is like, let's say, clinical issues, depression, anxiety, um, you know, going through family challenges, etc. Whereas in organizational psychology, the principle is that we are dealing with fully functional individuals, right? So we are not doing any corrective measures as in so if someone has got depression, anxiety, or something that needs therapy, you would not be dealing with an industrial psychologist because we deal with fully functioning individuals. And our psychology is focused on enhancing people within the workplace context. So you will even find that our theory and what we learn is significantly different from our clinical and counseling colleagues because we obviously have to understand the context of the workplace. So when you say, what is the actual psychology, right? Um, you know, are we counseling? Are we doing therapy in the workplace? No, we're not. Uh, mm. If you look at things like motivation, right? Uh, things such as career theory, how people progress. Um, if you look at things such as um, how do you deal with people, the different people dynamics, right? If I become yeah. appointed as a leader, how do I become a good leader, right? You know, what are the things that I need to keep my team engaged, right? To deal with conflict. All of those apply principles of psychology. So there is a psychological theory that underpins things like motivations. Why do people leave jobs? Why do we struggle to deal with certain people in the workplace? Why do we sometimes feel demotivated, right? Why do we get to a point where we want to change careers because we're just feeling stuck? So there's a lot of psychological underlying principles through many of, not most of the career related challenges. Then of course, not at an individual level, at more of a, um, an organizational level, so to speak. So when companies think of how do we keep people engaged, how do we then develop different career paths so that people can see that, okay, these are the different avenues. So in many times, we also design processes that enable companies to do things such as have a healthy work culture, deal with team conflict, etc. So listening to this, right, and if someone is in HR and I get this question a lot, uh, people will say, well, so what is the difference between, uh, you know, is organizational psychology and an HR professional or an OD? Or, there are many other professionals that are doing the, the work that I've just mentioned, right? OD, culture, diversity, talent management, uh, coaching, etc. right? So what is the difference? The difference is our approach, the frameworks and the theories that we use, right? So in many instances, you will find as an organizational psychologist, you are working with HR professionals or people from just different um, academic disciplines, right, who are doing similar work. And what differentiates us 
is what we call, you know, so we're, we're called scientist practitioners because we use science and we use the psychology in how we solve problems. So for me, I always say if people cannot differentiate what, how you as a psychologist, organizational psychologist approach a problem versus an HR professional or any other professional, right? Then the problem is with you and not the nature of the work because, you know, we might be solving the same problem with the same level of effectiveness, but our approach is very different because we come from that science practitioner model, um, right? I guess if, if that makes sense. Oh, wow. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm trying to simplify it in the most, yeah, in a manner, I guess, that makes practical sense for, for a person to grasp, but especially if people are not very familiar with what, what do you actually do. Okay, but maybe that is the question. So on a day-to-day, -day, you are an industrial psychologist, you are employed by an organization. So what does the day-to-day -day entail for somebody to at least just kind of get a picture of what this looks like? Really good question. So I want to start off by saying not every industrial psychologist is doing the same job or is within the same, you know, area of specialization, right? So I guess if you think about it, um, let's say if you think of lawyers, for example, not every lawyer is a labor lawyer. Some are labor lawyers, some are criminal lawyers, some are family and divorce lawyers, whatever, right? So in yeah. that regard, if someone says, what does a lawyer do? Well, it depends. If you're a criminal lawyer or if you're an advocate, you're probably doing different things than a corporate lawyer who is maybe sitting in an office dealing with different problems. So not yeah. every psychologist is doing the same area of specialization. So I'm going to then focus on my area of specialization, right? So I work in the area of talent management and career development. That's my area of speciality. So you have other organizational psychologists that are doing organizational development, culture, diversity, and many other things, right? So I'm going to focus on, on my area. So this then is just a caveat so that people realize that there are many ways you can apply yourself as a psychologist. And I think the two main domains I've applied myself, and I'll give an example of what I was doing is in the employability space, I worked in the youth employability space, and I guess I worked in corporate, you know, within consulting and talent management. And now I'm yeah. self-employed. So of course, my, my job might look different, um, you know, from maybe what it would in corporate. But ultimately, what I do in talent management is I help companies, one, design processes um, to manage their talent, right? So what does that mean? It means that companies usually think, how do we progress people within the organization? So from the time that they come in as graduates to the time that they develop and become executives, right? And of course, there's many different layers. How do we develop them, right? How do we decide where we invest our money? What kind of activities keep people engaged? What kind of activities help us to build skills, right? Build the right leaders, you know, build the right technical specialists, if that's the case. So basically designing end-to-end -end process just so that people or companies have got formal processes within which people can navigate their careers, um, right? So that's, I guess, one element. The second thing that I do within my career is succession planning. And succession okay. planning ultimately is, you know, predominantly done at an executive level, board level, etc. But ultimately what that means is when people who are in critical roles or in ex core or executive roles leave, right, or, you know, God mm. forbid something should happen to them, how do we plan so that we minimize the disruption? Because a CEO, a chief financial officer, a chief marketing officer leaving all of a sudden, or even, let's say, resigning, right, and serving, let's say, yeah. three months notice, there is major disruption because of the nature of the work that they do. And, of course, because you know, it's like mission, mission critical roles. So succession planning really is helping companies to make sure that when a person resigns or they leave an organization in the critical roles, we have already created a pipeline of people that we develop well ahead of time to make sure that they are smooth transitions, right? So that's what succession planning, you know, in very summary is. The other thing that I do is uh, leadership and management development. So basically when people are appointed to become managers, when people are even seasoned leaders at executive levels, right? You're carrying a lot of responsibilities. You're in charge of you know, many people, big departments, a lot of direct reports, etc. And um, the work that I do within leadership development is one, designing executive development programs. So these are basically training programs that train yeah. people at an executive level. I also do a lot of executive and career coaching. So this is helping people at a senior level 
enhance their leadership capabilities. And of course, that looks very different depending on what it is. So it could be a leader maybe that wants to be more assertive or perhaps they feel, you know, they want to um, have the ability to motivate their team, whatever, navigate a challenge. So really equipping leaders. And you actually find that because when it comes to leadership, many of their challenges is not the technical skills. So it's not about how do I do the strategy? Of course, I mean, there, there is obviously those elements, but a lot yeah. of the most difficult skills to develop for leaders and even managers, and I'm talking about my, even managers at a lower level, is those people dynamics. How do I become a good leader? How do I keep people engaged? How do I delegate appropriately? So helping managers just transition through various parts of their leadership journey. Then the other thing that I do is early career professionals, right? So also I know from you're also passionate about that um, population of, of, of people. So helping young people to transition to the world of work. So I work with universities. I work with a lot of institutes that you know work with youth basically to help prepare them either for the labor market or even just to prepare and set them up so that they can with ease transition into the world of work you know in the first uh, let's say year or two so that's part of the repertoire of work that i do under talent management you know in summary okay so so you said that the fact that you're an industrial psychologist and the next industrial psychologist, you find that you guys do different things. But your specialty is within mm. talent management. Mm. How did you get to a point where you chose that talent management was the thing for you? Yeah, I, I wonder if I chose it or if it chose me. It chose I, you. It, it chose me. <laughs> I think it chose and I think I actually found that because when you do your organizational psychology training, right, you get exposed to most of the areas of speciality that an organizational psychologist could apply themselves to, right? So okay. you okay. get that training and exposure. But I know, I mean, even before I trained as an organizational psychologist, I always loved the people development factor. Like I, I just always was finding myself trying to solve some sort of development issue. And I found that I was most engaged, most alive, most enticed when I was working with helping people develop themselves, designing programs. So I was fortunate yeah. enough that when I was actually doing my internship, um, I worked you know, in a consulting company where we were doing leadership development. And through that, we were designing programs, working you know, with mostly leaders and executives, you know, helping them in terms of programs and also individually. So for me, that's really where I thrive. And so therefore, even when I made my next career step, I always aligned and orientated myself towards roles that were predominantly, you know, talent management based, you know, okay. I, it's, just, it's, just my, it's just my thing. I suppose it's, it's something that I love and it keeps me engaged and I thrive in as well. Okay, no, that makes sense. Um, so thanks for people that are joining um, our live. If you've got any questions around this topic, we are talking to Fiona Martin about um, the career in industrial psychologist. And um, so please make sure that you drop us our drop some questions in here, then we will we'll get into them. But I think what I'm taking out of what you're saying, Fiona, is there's a sense of self-awareness that needs to come with it. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of you understanding what are the things that excite you or, or being aware that when you do this type of work, you are getting excited, you are getting fulfilled and you are getting happy. And out of that space, then you can then craft whatever that your niche is. Am I making sense? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, on the point you've mentioned, the because I became an organizational psychologist, I think I, I enrolled five years after I already was working. So it wasn't straight from varsity. So I graduated, worked for about five years, then I did my master's, then the whole qualification process. But I'll tell you the first five or well, four to five years of my career, I was very nomadic in that I just, I was not thriving, right? So I would have jobs, but I didn't enjoy them. And I could not understand because I'll start a job, I'll be excited. And a few weeks later, I'm like, okay, but is this it? What's next? And that happened, I think, like literally for the first five years. So the, some of the jobs were okay, but I just felt like, no, this can't be it. Like, I feel like my heart needs to be set on fire right, for the work that I was doing. And I had no self-awareness. I had no coach. I had no mentor. I don't even know how to go about navigating it, right? So that's why I thought maybe there is something wrong with me because I thought to myself, am I not suitable for corporate? Why is it that when I get into corporate, I find myself quickly getting bored, right? And the biggest mm. re revelation for me came when, 
So when I enrolled, when you enroll for your master's, you go through all these psychometrics. Um, it's like a very rigorous process. And when I got into the master's, they gave us feedback on the psychometrics. And one of the, the, the tools we did was the MBTI, which is a personality tool, the yeah. Myers-Briggs personality yeah. Myers-Briggs, yeah. Yes. And when the psychologist was giving me my feedback, like I felt like someone had opened my diary and was like reading it back to me. And I was like, oh my goodness. I was like, this makes sense. And it almost like I had this epiphany of, so that's why I was not enjoying because one, I didn't know how to align myself with roles, right? So as you said, when you don't have a good understanding of what are you good at, where do you thrive? And I didn't even know how to go about it. So, okay, let me think back in terms of, it's only when I got that revelation that I realized that actually, if I think about the times that I was engaged, the times I was enjoying myself or that I thrived, it was when I was doing this type of work. And the work that I was totally misaligned with, like I hated it. It made me, you know, in some instances, lose self-confidence because I thought, but why am I not, you know, why am I not enjoying it? Well, why do I feel like every time I so because I didn't know how to pay myself. And I think for me, I realized that actually I don't need to be good at I, those jobs were completely the opposite of the person that I am. Right. They were not aligned to my values, strengths, etc. So it was never going to work. And it was not a problem of me. It was a problem of fit because I didn't understand fit. Then you just think that, OK. There must be something wrong. So, so yes, I, I, I do appreciate that self-insight because it honestly, it, it changed my career because whenever I went out looking for work, that level of self-awareness helped me to, one, you know, evaluate jobs. And even where there were elements of the jobs that I didn't like, I understood it and accepted it. I realized that it's not about me. I know that I'm not really good at this stuff, so I'm not going to enjoy it, and that's okay. So, so that was a very important revelation uh, that, that I think helped me to, to then navigate my career at later stages. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for me, that's the point that I would like to make for most people. So the element of self-awareness is very critical. Um, and, and, and taking some of these tests, um, some of them are free online, you know, you don't need to really um, go to an industrial psychologist or whatever. You can take them at, at least get a sense. But if you do work with a coach or work with an industrial psychologist or a psychologist, it will just help you dig deeper. So there's Enneagram, there's Myers, but there's all sorts of things that you can do just for you to get to know yourself a little bit better and understand why you behave the way you behave or understand what motivates you and what drives you. Because some of these things, we, we, they are there, but maybe we don't really think about them that much. And, and it comes through in the work. And I can relate to what you're saying. Hence, that's why I've changed jobs. I've changed careers so many times. Because like my first career in finance, I'm not a routine person. I cannot be doing the same thing over and over again. It drives me insane. I can't be sitting there and working just behind a laptop or a computer by myself. That's not who I am. So I've had to kind of change and figure out things. So I like like project-based work. Mm -hmm. Something must start and finish. We can't be doing monthly reports every month. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I digress. But, but I think it, it, for me, the point is around self-awareness and really taking the time to understand yourself. So there's a, there's a comment here. Somebody's saying, hi, ladies. Thank you so much for this conversation. Very much needed. At Fiona, would you say getting work experience cultivated and contributed to the industrial psychologist you are today? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, it absolutely did. And in fact, my very first job was not even related to anything I studied, um, right? So I, I usually say to graduates, uh, and especially when you're trying to remember, when you've got no experience, people don't want to take a chance on you. I didn't get into a graduate program, which obviously is, is normally a nice way to start your career, but we know they're very competitive. So I took the first job, which was okay, but it, does, it was not even related because I thought to myself, the longer I'm unemployed, right, the harder it is going to be to get a job. So I just needed to almost like break that inexperience stigma, so to speak, uh, or spell, uh -huh. um, right? And I knew that this was not going to, I wasn't going to be here for long. And in fact, just because I was now employed, I, it was much easier for me to then get my subsequent jobs. But yes, absolutely, um, work experience counts. But look, I know many people that studied their industrial psychology, like they literally studied full time, went all the way to master's registration and then started working. So it's not really, there isn't really a right way to say, 
should I, you know, and this goes to any uh, further qualifications, right? So to a quick common question is, after honors, should I do my master's or whatever, pursue further things, right? And, and there's no right or wrong answer. So for me, because I was unsure of what I wanted to do, I, after honors, I went to work because I, I and in fact, actually one of the reasons I didn't pursue master's because I thought I must do master's then an internship, then a board exam, then this. It felt like a very long process. And I was like, nope, I'm done with school, right? And which was weird because when I started working and I underwent it, it went by very fast. Like, honestly, I was like, I can't believe I didn't do this because I, I thought, oh, it's going to take too long. But there isn't a right or wrong way. So either way, especially if you want to do psychology, you can literally do it. And in fact, you can't practice as a, as a psychologist without a master's. So if you are certain, and particularly if you're in the other fields like um, clinical um, and, and I guess any other discipline, if you want to practice, you need the master's. So if I had known back then, I might have maybe just done it one time and finished it because then other, you can still do, of course, a lot with like an honors degree in psychology or whatever, but ultimately to practice, you do need the master's. That's, that's non-negotiable. Yeah. And I was laughing with my daughter today, Fiona, because... I did one year of psychology a couple of years ago. I was already working with you at Multi Choice when I did my psychology year. Yeah. And I thought I will go through it and, and really qualify as a psychologist. And and as I was doing it, I was like, five years? In fact, part-time, it was even going to be more than that. But we were laughing today and we're like, and, and I was like, if I continued with it, I would be dead by now. Because <laughs> the time passes anyway, so it, it, but it, it goes fast, by no, fast. It goes by fast. But I had to ask myself, what was the main reason I was wanting to yes. do it? Mm. And that for me became the important thing. Like it was, a, it was an amazing experience. But I had to then go, do I really want to be a coach or do I want to be the psychologist? And it mm. became clear that coaching was the thing mm. and not the psychology part. And, and I think that's the conversation that we, we must have as part of this conversation because mm. you are an industrial psychologist and a coach, but it, and you've qualified differently as a coach. It doesn't, the fact that you're an industrial psychologist doesn't automatically make you a coach. Yeah, so really good. And, and I like the question of what do you, so I, I also get a lot of people who say, I want to do my master's or whatever because I want to do this. And in many instances, I'm like, well, actually, you know, for you to do this, unless it's for your own learning uh, and it's for your own, okay, I want to, you know, just uh, what you call it, um, pursue my, there's, you know, there's never a way to pursue education. But if the outcome, as you said, was you want to do coaching, actually, you, you are a coach, you can do coaching through many other avenues, right? Unless you say, look, I want to do it through this lens or through this discipline, then it's a different story. So you do get a lot of people that will say, I want to do my MBA because I want to get into this role. But I'm like, without an MBA, you probably can still get into that role, right? Exactly. Um, or yeah. So in many instances, as you said, it must be what is the outcome? So if it was the coaching that you loved, coaching has got many. In fact, I always say to people, there are many people from many disciplines that come. I remember actually when, when we did, uh, when I did the, the ICF coaching, we had people from all sorts of industries. In fact, most of them were not even from like people. It was people that had that orientation and they just found that naturally they would be coaching people, whether they were in finance or marketing, whatever the case might be, right? So it comes with an orientation, uh, right? Because it's that skill of, you know, you have a passion for guiding people, helping people work through problems. And it, it, so in that regard, you all, and as you pointed out, not every organizational psychologist is a coach, right? So for example, we get trained in career counseling. So that's part of our training, but it's not everyone's, you know, and that speaks again to areas of specialization. So a lot of my IOP friends would not do coaching or career counseling because it, although they might have been trained in it, but they didn't really practice it beyond that, right? Because it's not their area of interest. In the same way, there are many things that I learned in my master's, which are not really my, my passion. So therefore, be, to beyond that, I didn't actually pursue them. So especially for those of you that are interested in coaching, uh, yes, you don't necessarily need uh, the psychology degree unless the counseling and maybe there are other aspects that you want to do, but ultimately, particularly where it's just coaching, um, yeah, they, 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 there is no need. There are many ways you can pursue that without having to go through an entire qualification. Yeah. So I think I think I must have a different conversation about how do you actually get to be a qualified coach, because I think the biggest thing at the moment is 
people wake up and they go, I'm a coach, right? Yes. <laughs> and there's a lot that goes behind the scenes. But that's a totally different conversation. Yes. So Fiona, Fiona, talk to us about, so what does the schooling part look like? Um, are there specific subjects that you need to do to get into psychology? And once you get into, and, and, what, um, and, and what degree do you do specifically? And, and, that, and so what does that look like? If you can give us more details around that. Yeah, so this is a very, very important part because you need to get this right from the onset. So to qualify as a psychologist in any of the categories, it's very prescriptive. Right, so what does that mean? The first is you must do a psychology degree that is accredited by the Health Professions Council. So not every psychology degree that is out there is accredited. That means that the university has accredited their particular psychology because it must meet the standards, right? So when you are applying for psychology degrees, please always check with the faculty, is this a Health Professions Council uh, accredited, you know, whether it's counseling psychology or clinical, or whatever the case might be. Now, many, many moons ago when I studied, um, our psychology, we used to, I think our first few years, we would be in class with all categories of psychology. So whether it's counseling and people that, then I think we specialized in third and fourth year, if I remember correctly. But it seems now from an academic perspective and check with the academic institute because some of them have got different prescriptions. They, they are very strict about the subjects that you need to have done, especially from first year. So if you're starting your qualification from scratch, make sure that it's a Health Professions Council accredited qualification and make sure that you're taking the proper modules. Because I had a, someone who, a student who was doing, I think, clinical psychology, and then she wanted to swap to organizational. She was already in third year, but she was being told she has to start from scratch, right? Because it looks wow. like now... They, they start already from first year in terms of doing the specializations, whereas we, we've specialized a little bit later on. So in that regard, mm -hmm. I did speak to a couple of my colleagues who are heads of divisions in industrial psychology departments at some of the universities, and they did actually confirm that, yes, unfortunately, um, she would have to start because the, the modules that you take from the first year, if you're doing clinical counseling or something else, you're not going to have those prescribed, right? So they're very strict about that. If, let's say, for example, you maybe did psychology five years ago, maybe it was like a general honors or some other sort, and now you want to go into an honors and a master's, right? In many instances, you might have to redo certain years. So sometimes you might say redo your third or fourth year because you cannot yeah. proceed into honors or master's without certain prescribed. And I think they were less stricter many years ago that that's my sense um right yeah. so ultimately one make sure that it's health professions council speak to the faculty if it's a case where you have already started you've got some qualifications and maybe you want to jump onto a stream um, or, or an organizational psychology path it sometimes is university specific so speak to the particular faculty send them your transcript and say look i've done these psychology modules do any of these contribute towards uh, organizational psychology right and yeah. look, unless you went in that stream, in many instances, they might say none of these because they said there's very different modules. So clinical and counseling psychologists focus very much around pathology, et cetera. Whereas in organizational psychology, we focus very much on, you know, things like personnel psychology, career psychology, uh, organizational development. So it's things that people in the other disciplines will, will not even uh, touch, uh, right? So yeah, so someone is saying they read did Psych 3. So unfortunately, yeah. they're very strict. The other element to consider is, and I know this is something that is, you know, that's well spoken about in the industry. For many institutes, getting into masters is very difficult, is very selective. Most universities do not take more than 20 masters students. I think it's like actually 15, between 15 to 20 at the most. So you can imagine at honors level, maybe there's like 80 or 100 of you in class. And then now come masters, there's only space for 20. So that is the other challenge, right? In that it's, it's extremely difficult to get through. Um, and I know some people who will apply maybe for three years in a row, just sort of trying to get through. I, I know that for many months ago when I went in, they definitely want a high mark at honors. I think at that time it was like 65% minimum, if I remember correctly. And maybe it might, I'm not sure if it's so it's universities have different. So you need to have yeah. done quite well at your honors. Uh, and then, of course, they normally have a very rigorous process, even as part of the selection process. So that's the other challenge to consider that it's very difficult because the spaces at all the universities are limited. And of course, the number of people 
trying, and this is not only for organizational psychology, this is for all the disciplines, uh, clinical counseling, etc. cetera. So, so that's something that you also need to consider. And what I would do is, while, if you want to pursue that, speak especially to people that are working in academia, right? So, I mean, I can give you a high level perspective, but I find that my colleagues who are in academia can give you to say, look, you need these modules at these marks, and these are the things that you need to do. So they will give you the criteria and please do speak and get the requirements so that you can work towards that if it's something that you want to attempt to. Yeah. So, so what, is, what, is the, what is the trick with moving people into masters? Um, so why a small number? Is it because of supervisors? Like why, why, why are they this selective? Yeah, that's actually a good question. I'm not even sure that I, I personally know the, the answer to that. And, and because it's something that is, a, is raised as a complaint by a lot of honest students to say, look, we want to proceed, we want to qualify, but universities are only taking 20 people. So I don't know if it's a case of, as you said, the super, it, maybe it could be a matter of the supervision, I, but I don't know, you know, that, that, that because yes, you do need to be supervised when you do the internship, yeah. both from the university side and then, of course, from your organization side. But that's actually a very, very good question. Maybe I will speak to some of my colleagues in the, in the academic space just to get an understanding of why only 20 and why can't they take more? Yeah, okay, that's very interesting. So, so you go through the, the education, the, the schooling part where you're doing your, 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 your junior degree, you do your honors, and then you do your master's. So when do you do your practicals and when do you then qualify and go, okay, now I'm a psychologist? When, when, when does that happen? Okay, good question. Okay, I see someone made, made a comment there that it's the Health Professions Council that sets those numbers. So, it's, so perhaps that could be the reason. But uh, to answer your question, <laughs> so you finish your, your exam, you complete and you pass your master's, right? So you must pass your master's, you know, get your, your qualification. Then thereafter, you must do a 12-month accredited internship, right? And by accredited, it means it must be accredited by the Health Professions Council. So there are several ways to do this. So I guess maybe two major ways to do this. You could either go into a program that is already pre-approved. So you find that companies that run a psychology internships yearly, they would have already gotten their there's approved already with the Health Professions Council, right? So, you know, kind of like, I guess, PSYCA, you know, if you go into a pre-approved program, et cetera. So that's the one. Yeah. But of course, those programs are very competitive, et cetera. So what if I cannot get into one of the structured programs at an organization that has already, you know, gotten a pre-approved program? The second thing you, you can do, in fact, we do this at the, at uh, SIOPSA, which is the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology, because we realize that the challenge that it creates you can also design your own and then get it approved, right? So when I did my psychology internship, although I was working for a company that used to take interns yearly, because it was a consulting environment, there wasn't like a day job, right? As you're saying, there wasn't a structure to the job. So you then had to design and say, look, in the 12 months, and in fact, you could even do this. If you're at an organization where maybe there's no program, you have to design it, but usually you will take the, the hours that the Health Professions Council prescribes. So they will often yeah. prescribe to say, you need this many hours in these areas. And then you in your program need to say, okay, I'm, my OD experience, I'm going to do it at this organization. These are my activities. This is what I'm planning. I'm on this project. I'm, so you need to actually describe what you, so that obviously it satisfies their requirements. So you can design your own where you actually map out the activities you're doing in line with the Health Professions Council. Then you have to take it to the HPCSA. Then they have to review it and say, okay, this program that you have designed at your organization meets the requirements. So that can also be a bit tricky because then dealing with the Health Professions Council and getting your program approved nightmare. I mean, I don't know if it still is, but I, I remember it was like a nightmare because, you know, it was very bureaucratic, very admin, it takes forever and whatever the case. So that's the second thing. The third thing is you need two supervisors. So you need, I guess, your corporate supervisor or which, whichever institute that you're working at, right? Um, to supervise you. This is someone that is going to be making sure that you're meeting the activity. They're going to be evaluating and making sure that you're gaining the proficiencies, right? So that's your first supervisor. Your second supervisor is, has to be at your academic um, institute. So usually there's one allocated way, wherever you do your master's, they normally have like an internship supervisor. And normally yeah. that academic one 
they take, I think it was like quarterly that we used to do the academic one. So I think it was like every two weeks or monthly, I used to meet with my, my supervisor. Then every quarter or it was, yeah, every quarter I used to then meet with my supervisor at the university and then just give them a rundown of what we've done. So there's a lot of documentation and reporting, which obviously then has to be approved by my university supervisor. So if you're not meeting the hours or maybe they're not satisfied with the activities and you know sometimes you, you also provide a portfolio of evidence etc then they might say look you need more hours here or you know i'm not happy with the proficiency here, etc so those are the two supervisors that need to be signing you off as you get along right now when you come to the end of the 12 months or i guess the hours right it's more about the hours you will then get that signed off by your first supervisor and your academic supervisor. So if they're satisfied, yes, so your corporate supervisor has to be an industrial psychologist who has been qualified for at least two years. So it can be a newly qualified one. What you can do, if there is no organizational psychologist at the company you are working for, they do allow you to get one that's working elsewhere, as long as they can fulfill those okay. duties. So many times, yeah. you know, people will approach me and say, hey, Fiona, you know, I, there's no organizational psychologist here. Can you be my supervisor? Then in many instances, you have to obviously like pay them, I guess, for their time, especially if they're not for your company, unless they're willing to do it for free, which in many instances is not the case. So you can get a psychologist that is not at your company if you don't have one. They, they do accept that as long as they obviously submit that they are going to fulfill those duties. Then once you have finished your hours and your hours have been signed off, and your hours have been approved by the health professions council right then you will write the board exam right and in that board uh -huh. exam um it's basically yeah i guess it's your board exam so you i think they write it twice a year so i think that you, you can write it either in february or november or something of that sort so of course depending on when you'll be ready and when you would have studied you will then write the board exam you have to pass the board exam and once you pass the board exam you will then get your accreditation or your qualification as a registered health professional in whatever psychology category that you obviously you have qualified in okay and and now as 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 a qualified industrial psychologist now do you need to keep um what's the word i'm looking for keep renewing your membership with the HPCSA or whatever they're called and and just keep um does that word when you keep getting um yeah so you keep your continuous improvement whatever professional cpd whatever they're called yes, those absolutely. <laughs> so absolutely so to keep your certification every year you have to pay annual fees right um yeah. so thank you someone is saying you write the exams three times a year thanks for putting that so you have to pay annual fees every year to keep your your license if you're working for a company, most companies will actually pay those under, you know, professional whatever certifications. Then you have to do certain number of CPD points every year. So hence, yeah. you know, attending conferences, events, and there's many platforms. In fact, if you're part of the Health Professional Council of South Africa, particularly where, uh, sorry, I mean, if you're part of SIOPSA, where you attend, like our annual conference normally gives you like a lot of, if not majority of your points. So as an industrial psychologist, you then have to, make sure you're doing enough activities. I can't remember how many CPD points you need per year, but of course then you will then either do them online, attend an event, etc. So there's various ways that, but yes, you definitely need to do that. Okay. Wow. I hope um, people that have been listening to us have really gotten something out of it. There is a, there is a question here, Fiona, and I'm not sure if you're the right person to answer. I'm definitely not. I can tell you that much. Um, somebody is saying, I think it's Sandra Sneeman, says, my orthopedic surgeon booked me off at work and I gave them the letter, but they are saying they want a report. Is this even legal? I don't know. So Ooh, I yeah. might not be the um, Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm also unable to answer that. I'm not sure from an, I guess, from an HR operational perspective, you know, can someone legally request a report or something to, to that effect. So unfortunately, I'm not able to assist. Um, you can maybe see, I mean, I'm not sure if she has the capacity to respond, but if you follow up on Niwe at Dangsta, she's an HR professional. I know she's, she's the perfect person to ask this. So maybe you can try and see if you can ask it and uh, if she'll respond. But yeah, she, she's the ideal person to, to, to be able to do justice to that question. Okay, no, that's great. So Sandra, I hope get hold of 
Boniwet, I think Boniwet danced that, and um, she she might be able to help you, and 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 she can maybe give you an answer on those bases. So I think the biggest thing is, so what are things that somebody really needs to think about if they want to get into industrial psychology? Uh, is there anything that you that is kind of glaring for you, or it's like? You know, you can be whoever, whatever, and you can do it. But is there anything specific that you can think about? Yeah, I think for me, you know, I guess getting a good understanding of what is the type of work, right? That or wait, how do I, how can I apply myself as an industrial psychologist, right? Is that something that I see myself doing? Are those activities that I know I was because the investment in getting the qualification is quite a lot. So you must be quite sure that you know this is something that I want to do, etc. You must have, I think, a good level of, um, of you know, self-awareness, uh, you know, yeah. because in many instances, you're dealing with people, you're dealing with complex problems. You do have organizational psychologists that maybe are not so much of the people part, maybe they're more on the process, et cetera, right? But ultimately, for me, because of the profession that you hold, that self-awareness is very important. So you even find through your, our qualifications, we do a lot of self-reflections because you're going out to help people in whatever capacity you, you, you must, I guess, you know, have that good understanding, you know, of who you are, etc. And particularly because of the nature of the problems that we're dealing, I, a lot of it has to do with people, people dynamics, etc. So, so you, you must, I think, yeah, have a, have a certain level of, of, of self awareness. Um, I think also yeah, you must enjoy, as I said, industrial psychologists are scientists practitioners. So you really must enjoy, you know, science, all right? And by science is a lot of the work that we do is based on, you know, theories, frameworks. There's literally like a theory and a framework for everything, all right? So in many instances, yeah. as a scientist practitioner, you have to make sure that your solutions have scientific rigor. So that is what differentiates what an organizational psychologist do. And, you know, you know like management fads. There's a lot of fads that are out there. In fact, I was actually telling my, my students the other day that um, as, you know, a professional, you... you, you your scientific rigor must differ from someone coming with some sort of leadership fad or management fad from, that has got no scientific evidence, right? It's got no backing, it's got no research, it's got no, so that's what you're So as an organizational psychologist, when you're proposing solutions, it, of course, you're not going to be showing that to the client. But if I say that, look, doing ABC is linked to increased engagement or doing ABC is linked to increased self-awareness, there must be scientific evidence that shows it. That is exactly what differentiates you. So you must be a person that enjoys um, right theory, that enjoys framework. So as much as maybe people are not so much aware, a lot of the work, a lot of the content that I do, I read a lot of academic journals uh, behind the scenes, right? Because that's how I get updated. And that's how I also equip myself just in terms of making sure that if I'm proposing a solution, there is scientific rigor and it is defensible. I can defend it, you know, should I need to. Yeah, but for, I've just thought about it. From a schooling part, are there specific subjects that you need to do for you to then um, um, study psychology or not? Oh, you mean in high school? High school. I mean high school. Yeah. Ah, geez. Oh, it's been, it's been ages. I cannot even remember. Uh, but you would have to check with the academic institute. I think from what I remember, you had to... Yes, there is certain score that you must meet, I think, just around your matric. But I, I cannot remember if you had to do certain subjects. I, honestly, it's been like many, many months since I, I, I did my very first degree. So I, I cannot honestly remember um, what you had to qualify for, from, especially if you're in matric and wanting to aim for that. Yeah, because so I'm, I'm trying to think whether you have to do science or you have to do, I don't know, Biology. It used yeah, to be I biology do. in our time. I don't know it's something else. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely didn't do sciences. I, I did, I think, economics, and I can't even remember, um, and some other random other stuff. But, but no. Yeah. Um, but just check with the university. In fact, in many instances, if you go to the particular university, they will probably tell you the criteria of how they would then, uh, you know, accept. Particularly if, you, if you're coming in at an undergrad or first year level. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, guys, I've run out of questions. I don't know if you've got still have questions for Fiona. Um, if you do, um, please pop them in. Um, yeah, I think it's been an interesting conversation. Uh, Fiona really 
thank you for for taking the time um i always appreciate that you are always willing to just do these things with me um and and i think that for me becomes because yeah i really want to thank you for that um buyi is commenting here and in university you will do statistics to get your psychology degree so there's part the stats as well oh god i don't i don't i i know that definitely we are the stats module particularly with the research right because the research part is very important yeah. is very important so but i don't remember doing stats like outside of those research when i think that was acting third or fourth year but as i said i studied donkey donkey years ago so it could very well have changed um now in terms of the, the undergrad but yes especially particularly around the research model so i know that we did a lot of just like research methodology i think around third or fourth year and then when you do your masters that's like baptism by fire where you, the research like it just completely is like you know insane etc but yeah the stats is important particularly because you know a lot of research especially if you do quantitative has statistical analysis um so i think that was another reason why i i think i i decided i wasn't doing this because i'm not a huge research person somebody else must do the research and i must <laughs> i must consume it having <laughs> <laughs> No the research part is like very integral it's, it's it's very very integral so if you don't I I hated research until my masters because I guess it, ultimately I ended up doing I think a topic that I enjoyed but the methodology and the behind the scenes mechanics yeah it's it's not it's not fun um yeah, it's not fun but but definitely I think I got an appreciation for it uh, so it's something yeah, that you you have to i guess force yourself because i didn't like it either but i was like look if i want to do this i have to find a way to make this enjoyable and i guess tolerable yeah yeah so fiona you can you answer this do i have to do the internship after masters or can i do it before completing masters i think you yeah. did talk to it yes yeah, yeah. so um they, they they changed it a few years ago because be, because before in your second year of masters or as you, or half with or like you could during your masters do an internship but now because i think there were a lot of people that were doing internships and they're not completing their masters etc so now they strictly want you to have attained your master so you cannot actually register as a student psychologist with the health professions council without your completed qualification from the oh. university so unfortunately the answer is you must have the completed masters first and that means document degree in hand uh, for you to be able to actually register as a student psychologist wow Great. Anyway, guys, I think you I think this has been marvelous. Like marvelous. Like the, the I think the information that you've shared, your own experience has has really helped a lot of people. So, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Um I'm going to be doing a lot more around these career things as I said. Um I get a lot of people who want to change careers. and and they are talking big titles and big things but they don't know the detail they don't know the detail that goes into it um and for me um if we can share this information with different people i think it's the best thing that we 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 have i think we must also have a conversation about being a coach right yeah. because both yeah. of us both of us have done have done the journey <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know but, so i think that would be a good one as well to have but i will be bringing a lot of people to talk about different um careers and and i think if anybody finds it useful i'm really grateful thanks fiona and really appreciate it thank you so much and i look forward to chatting again um, in future cool thanks guys um keep yes. well i will I will save the the Insta live so you can refer people to it they it will be on my on, on my feed so yeah thank you very much bye yes bye bye, bye everybody bye <laughs>